Uh, hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. Uh, my name is Michael Foley and I'll be the host this evening. Uh, wanna, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker this evening, Joseph Dessler Costa. Uh, Joseph is an American artist working in photography, video, and new media. His work employs a number of techniques including multiple exposure and collage to explore consumers' dreams influence and origins of desire. He holds an MFA degree from Bard College. Recent exhibitions include Soft Powers at Clamp Art in New York here, The Violent Sequence, Metronome in Medina, Them at Transformer Station in Cleveland, Particle Paradise at Yours Truly Foley Gallery, Thread Count, Unseen, Amsterdam, and Photography is Magic at the Aperture Foundation here in New York. Costa has curated and organized a number of exhibitions, books, and zines, and in 2014, he founded the imprint Silent Face Projects. Costa is a faculty member at the School of Visual Arts, Parsons, and the International Center of Photography, all in New York City. So please welcome Joseph Dessler Costa. Hey, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming out on this steamy October night, right? Um, I want a special thanks to Michael. Uh, Michael's been an early supporter of my work. We've known each other since, yeah, I was since, a lot younger. Uh, graduation, when you were yeah. graduating at uh, ISIS uh, Barton? Yeah, when I finished. And uh, it's been amazing that we've kept this relationship going over the years. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, so again, my name is Joseph Dessler Costa. Uh, I'm born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, I teach here, like Michael said, at SVA, Parsons, and ICP. Um, I have an artistic practice as well as a commercial studio practice. And as he said, I also run a small publishing collective called Silent Face Projects. Um, over the years, I've slowly, slowly come to define myself as a still life photographer. I think at the beginning, that was because it was a really easy thing to explain to my mother that made sense. Um, when she was always asking, what is it you do? It seemed like a nice landing point. Um, but over time, that's become increasingly true, both in my uh, still photo practice, uh, my commercial practice, and in my video film practice. Um, in my commercial practice, I shoot a lot of shoes and handbags and eyewear. And in my commercial practice lately, that's become sort of the same. <laughs> I still shoot a lot of shoes and eyewear and handbags. Um, so as I said, I grew up in Pittsburgh and I came in of age of, in the 90s in Pittsburgh. And I think that was a really formative place for me. Um, as many of you know, Pittsburgh is a Rust Belt city that's gone through many transformations over the years. When I was there, it was sort of that moment where things were about to change because of the internet was like, there was like, you, it felt it was coming even before it came, right? But there was this weird way in that Pittsburgh was always almost, right? It was never quite what it was supposed to be. It was never, it was always in the shadow of these other kind of glamorous places in the U.S., like New York or L.A. or other cities. It was always sort of like in the shadow. Um, it was a city in tr transition. Um, and while I grew up, I remember like seeing a lot of sort of decline and rust and closed factories. And I always had this idea that uh, there had to be more out there, right? Because I saw more out there in magazines. I saw, saw more out there on television. I saw, saw more out there in MTV. And when I was young, I began looking at comic books, and then that became like skate culture magazines, and then that became fashion magazines and music, and the culture of music via MTV. I was kind of like just digesting and digesting this media, and it, came, it became a vehicle for me to sort of like imagine these other places out there, right, that I couldn't quite touch or get to. And so like for me, like film and TV and comic books and alter this alternate media, it started to represent alternate possibilities, right, like invention in a way. Um, so here's me in the late 80s in Pittsburgh, my comic book infatuation in full force. But when I was putting together this slideshow, I was also found this picture. And I also see myself as a really young person imagining sort of potential and power, right? Imagining there's other possibilities, um, right? And growing up there every day, 
you know, being in sort of this like middle America, this middle sort of place that wasn't quite somewhere, you know, surrounded with objects and banality. You know, there were grocery stores and shopping malls and car washes and of course cans of soup. And of course if you grow up in Pittsburgh, in Pennsylvania, you cannot escape the shadow of Andy Warhol, right? And in being an in interested in images, it was re literally one of the first artists I was ever exposed to was Andy Warhol at a really young age. And I remember my grandmother being like, oh, he's not really an artist, but we'll go to the Warhol Museum and see it. And um, I, it really affected me as a child. And I remember thinking about how like this transformation is possible, right, via images. Like a soup can is a soup can, but a soup can can be more than a soup can, right? And everyday objects can be elevated and sort of transformed and turned into other things. Um, and that's something that I think really, really affected me. And I, at the same time, I'm digesting all this kind of like media from MTV. My parents were never home, so I could watch TV whenever <laughs> I wanted, right? Or like, it was pre-internet, but I was looking at magazines. So I just really, and when I think of my my formative years, I think of this moment, these moments where I was just looking at magazines and. Uh, my father also had an office, so we got all these subscriptions to magazines for the waiting room. And like, it was a way that I just constantly was seeing and thinking, and they became this like vehicle and this idea, right? So when I think about Warhol and like, you know, thinking about this concept of a thing can be more than the thing it actually is, he also had this idea that like, um, making art was a form of consumer production, right? Like we are producing, we are all producing art in our kind of desires to like consume and, and, and digest these things. And that's something that really sort of has been a thread through my work um, from the early years when I was making like scape videos to even sort of the like stuff I'm working on now, right? How to make something other, how to play with illusion, how to play with desire. Um, so a wristwatch can be more than a wristwatch, as we see here, and it becomes more of something if I, if I want it, right? Uh, if you want something, right, if you want this wristwatch, you imagine a better version of you once you have that wristwatch, right? Or once I have those new shoes or those new pants, they'll be the more elevated version of me. Of course, that's completely superficial, right? but it's also something we all very much fall victim to, I think, right? Seeking out this alternative version, this better version of ourselves. Um, so looking at these pictures and growing up in that environment, I, had, I, I was aware of this uncomfortable feeling of wanting, and I remember being pulled by these pictures that I saw in magazines and books in different confusing ways, right? In my relationship to myself, to the world, to my own image. Um, so here's me in the late 1980s, dream, again, of dreaming of superpowers in this costume made out of like a red hoodie and yellow socks, right? Like these really generic ways. And here's me in the late 90s <laughs> dreaming of being Kurt Copain, right? Like I decided to include, like I was like, I don't know if I can include this picture or not, but I, I feel like I have to because it really is a part of like this idea that like there's constantly like this invention of the self, right? This invention of who we can be, what possibility is. And for me in the late 90s, it was like Kurt Cobain and looking at MTV and understanding and also influencing the image I had of myself. And then eventually understanding the fluidity of that image. And then of course, as I started to work and work more, the way we're all susceptible to influence, right? The way that these pictures influence me, but behind them there's someone pulling those strings, right? So it's not something I'm completely in control of, these things that are kind of working on me and massaging me and, and making me feel one way or the other. So that's sort of my embarrassing picture backstory, right? But let's get to my work. Um, so again, the visual, my interest in sort of this visual language of desire and influence and um, objects, it's rooted in these early memories um, in Pittsburgh in the 80s and 90s, right? like the pop culture images from television, magazines. Um, and these things, aside from creating desire, they created sort of this idea of like beauty and sheen that was really in contradiction to sort of the closed factories and the rusted bridges and like the street signs that were bent. And like it was really this stark difference from the reality I lived and the reality I saw. Um, 
And so as being that generation that grew up right at the moment where the internet, right before, like I had one foot before the internet and one foot after, right? I had like, I remember getting the first cell phone that had like this antenna, <laughs> right? And I think before the like ubiquity of the internet, like this commercial culture presented itself as like this path out of, past path to something else. And that, that's where sort of my interest has re remains uh, as an artist working. Um, right, so this is one of the, this is a picture I feel like is really important in that moment for me when I was sort of figuring out where the work I make, you know, exists and lies. Um, this is called Layered Guitars, and I was really exploring sort of the, the power of symbols and objects, but also exploring my own sort of like consumer dreams and nostalgia and my fantasy and like that guy that wanted to be Kurt Cobain, right? Like, this was a way of like picturing that without picturing it. Um, this is another picture sort of from that period where I was really, I would, had just finished uh, graduate school and I was really thinking about where my work resided because I was also, before I went to graduate school, I was working commercially as well. Um, so obviously I, I, I really tried to use the language of that commercial imagery to examine sort of these aesthetics that were working their ways on me, right? And if I think thinking about that, I started to think about also perception um, and the way that I perceive objects and the way that my interests bend under these influences. Um, this is another piece that was very formative and sort of that, sort of really getting to this. This is called 4545s um, and those three pieces, the guitars, the sunglasses, and this piece were also made at a time when I had a child. And so I was no longer able to uh, go around and take pictures because I was always like taking care of a child. It was a lot of work. So the only time I could make pictures was at night after everyone is bed, I could go to my studio and make pictures. So my practice suddenly became about uh, constructing pictures, about making pictures rather than taking pictures. And some of my students are here and you guys hear me say that all the time, right? This big difference between making and taking. Um, and for me, that was like the gateway into like making pictures and constructing pictures. So, um, you know, I started to play with paper. Um, I started to play with multiple exposure and I started to play with like a uh, fishing line and wire and string. And this was all out of like I found this box with 40, a bunch of 45s in it and there were actually 45 of them. So like just like random and it kind of created this whole sort of idea. Um, another important thing to, to mention is I'm also always been a musician like in garage bands and different things. So also this idea of that that music culture all, also, all, also really sort of entered into my picture making. Um, and so this is sort of also the time I met Michael and we uh, came by the studio. Um, it was my first studio visit I ever had actually, which was pretty, pretty cool, yeah. Uh, so I was lucky to meet Michael and we, did, we looked at some work and he uh, invited me to do a show and that show was called Extreme Learning Machine. And those, these are pictures from that show from that period. And again, these were all part of this sort of studio-based practice that I was making at night in the studio. And I was trying to make pictures that I was, it was like kind of this reverse learning. Instead of using Photoshop to make pictures, I was trying to use Photoshop to teach me how to make pictures in a camera, right? So these were done with like ripped paper, multiple exposure, strings. I was trying to replicate in camera what I was seeing like in Adobe happening, you know, in advertising or in um, different ways. And, it, and I was interested in doing that because it, came, it became clumsier. It became sort of less perfect. Um, so I was kind of replicating what the computer could do but in camera and I don't know if you can, I remember speaking with Michael a lot and sometimes if you approach the pictures, pictures closer you can see a lot of imperfections. You can see the rip in the paper, you can see the places where they're not sort of like perfect but like at a distance they have that perfection feeling but they're simply just some rips and multiple exposures and different things like that. Working like that also in that period of time also got me really thinking about, excuse me, illusion, right? About how photography can be used for illusion. And that tied in 
really a lot into the things I was thinking about photography creating this illusion of a better sort of reality, a better me if I could only get that wristwatch or those pants or something. Um, so that was sort of a moment, a really, this was like a really sort of formative moment for me, this body of work. Um, I also really started to think about, a produ think about production, right? Um, about how a, picture become, how a picture can become a physical object. Even if it's shot on film, if it's then scanned, it still becomes X's and O's. And in the end, I really wanted to have an object, a physical object. Um, and I started to really think about how things can become, how do you make a picture that's this sort of un intangible thing into a solid piece, like hanging in a gallery. Um, I also started to think about the rhetorical power of pictures, right? That pictures are essentially a language. And so a picture means one thing by itself, right? But a picture is when grouped together can also start to take on these meanings in a way that sort of, I don't know, choruses in a song with the verse matches or words match together. So I started to think about that a lot. Uh, this is a piece called Sun-Kissed Eclipse. And again, thinking about production, this was a piece that in its end became a LED, like ultra-thin light box. But again, this was made using that sort of studio illusion. That's simply a piece of black foam core with, I don't know how many holes drilled in it with like a drill. And then I hung 13 bottles of Sun-Kissed at different lengths behind it, right, and lit it from behind. So you know, at a distance or as a JPEG, it looks perfect, but if you were to approach the actual piece, you could see sort of frays in the, in the way it's all cut and put together. It reveals itself a little bit, but there's like a human hand in it. So again, that idea between putting, learning from like what computers can do and trying to make it human. This was that piece as a light box here um, in the gallery. <clears throat> Um, and then thinking about productions in terms of like the other pictures I started, I discovered by accident this process called dye sublimation. And it's a process in which um, the inks are sublimated into an aluminum substrate. So um, I don't know, it's kind of seemed fantastical to me at the time when I learned about it. So they, it's essentially like an iron on on a t-shirt, if I really want to explain it, like in a simple terms. but. The printer explained it to me at the time when they press it and heat it, the inks become gas and sublimate into the aluminum. So it seemed fantastical to me. And the beautiful thing about um, that is that at the end, like I had this solid piece of picture that like was, I could kick and I, it didn't have glass on it. I could like sneeze on it and wipe it off. It became like an automobile in a way. It became like a solid physical object in a way that pictures on screens don't feel like. And that felt right to me. That felt in line what I understood about like Warhol's idea of production. Um, and it felt, like I said, kicking the tire on a new car, right? It felt like coming off an assembly line. And they felt strong and physical, and they felt weirdly in between coming. They didn't feel quite like they came out of an artist's studio. They felt almost like they came off an assembly line. And that also felt really in line sort of with what I was thinking about. Um, this is a piece called White Body. Um, I think I bought that mannequin around here somewhere on one of these streets around here. And then just, you know, playing with gradients in the background to again copy or emulate that idea of these sort of Adobe um, backgrounds. Uh, this is called Wayfair. Sort of the same thing. I was really thinking about objects three dimensionally floating in space. Um, or Black Body bought it, it, you know, just a mannequin bought at the same place. And again, I was, by doing all this and being in the studio and being at night and being tired, I was trying all these different kind of things. So I started to also shoot through screens and gels and different things that would like kind of bring this haze to the, to the image surface. Um, it was literally like I, I would have a list and go to my studio and just like collect stuff and see what I could do each night to form these things, right? Uh, working with shadow and paper and uh, um, like the latex glove, like thinking about constructions that feel kind of cheap but also elevated, right? Um, 
or there was a used tire place next to my studio and they would throw out all these used tires on the street at night so one night just bringing them up in the studio and hanging them with you know rope and multiple exposing them in that way again objects and then going full on into my Warhol Velvet Underground sort of emulation um, but this time working with paint and a banana and thinking about how the subject sort of can leak onto a background right rather than vice versa um, and I like this one too because it's it has a certain kind of naughtiness to it that I like um, and then again like dealing with that aesthetic of advertising and seeking how to transform things it's a little dark here but these are this is called nine laptops it's just nine laptops I borrowed from um, other friends and laid them out and to form this sort of rainbow portal right and how these ob everyday objects again can sort of become something else take us to this different place um, at the same time that I'm making this work I also was like going on walks and I was seeing like jewelry stores at night without jewelry in the windows right but they would have these <coughs> elaborate excuse me these elaborate empty merchandising displays for jewelry or walking around in stores so I thought about how like the geometry of those and this is one I made in the studio that's made out of blue like urethane and gaff tape so uh, photographed and looked at a distance it looks like this sort of digital construction but if you were to go close to it you can see rips in the gaff tape you can see some texture in the urethane which is kind of like a uh, like a styrofoam material um, and also scale like the thing I built was maybe like not so big but in the photo photograph it became this sort of mammoth construction um, this piece also became an ultra thin light box um, which I don't know it's just like further that feeling of I don't know otherness and like uh, just oddness but then I always love that to leave a clue about like seeing something that revealed sort of the um, the junkiness of it actually right um, which was is, is an interesting thing because I feel like as I go on and you'll see in my later I feel like in a way I've started to uh, exclude that junkiness and I'm not I don't know it's something I'm thinking a lot about lately is does that does that sort of imperfection need to make its way back in um, this is another piece, this is multiple exposure. This is just black foam core cut with white tape put around the edges. So they become these sort of geometric explorations, but for me they were literally just these moments of trying to figure out what I could make happen in a camera. Um, here's another one, this is white foam core with black tape on it in a multiple exposure. It was literally like the beauty I was having with these was I had no idea what it was gonna look like and the sort of magic of that happening where you see oh my god this looks good and of course you're seeing these successful ones there are a lot of horrible failure ones that happen along the way and that's all part of like the same process or the process right like learning it was all via failure um, and, so, and then those pieces became yeah physical in the end this is again printed on aluminum it has that dye sublimation kind of presence to it um, that, that I love, that just feels like impenetrable. Um, so that was the show Extreme Mer Learning Machine and after that show I was trying to think about like what what happened, what, like what, ha I can't keep doing this sort of same thing so I started to think a lot about like print surface and I was working, I was, that's when I started teaching at SVA so suddenly I had access to a print lab for free. So I was making prints I don't know why, just making a bunch of prints and bringing them back to my studio. And then I started like making prints, re-photographing the prints, like doing multiple exposure with prints itself. And so in a weird way, this is like the moment where I really felt like I was being a still life photographer because I was, I was, I was making multiple exposures of different prints that I was making. Um, and that started to, it started to move to a different feel and I, I really started to like sort of this haziness that started to develop in the pictures. The pictures from the previous body of work were they were very concise and very sharp and very strong and angular and by re-photographing prints this this haziness starts to to develop in the prints. 
um, in the pictures. And it started, it started to feel like the pictures themselves were like disappearing and moving up, right? They were moving from this hard, they were moving from this intangible material to a hard material, but when I looked at the print, I felt like all the pieces were, were moving away. They were moving upward. They were flowing, they were flowing out. Mm, like they were floating away. And they felt like they were disappearing the moment I, I, I was making them in a way because of this haziness, because of the way that there was this odd depth in them. Um, and I'm still, still at this point working with, I'm even photographing prints through screens or I literally mean screens like a window screen that will create, if it's not in focus, it creates this, this odd haze or, you know, multiple exposing a colored gel out of focus or different ways, that's working. Um, and this is another picture in that series. This one was like, it's kind of like a B-side. I've never <laughs> used this picture, but I, I think it's, I like it because when I was putting this together, I found this cool like BTS studio footage of like what, how like junky my setup looks. I'm not sure why there's that line in the middle of it, but right? <laughs> you can see the wire and you can see sort of the, yeah, the, 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 the jankiness of it. I don't know a better word. I'm from Pittsburgh. We say janky. It's like a, it means junky. Yeah. And you can see that part of it. Um, well, I guess I did print it once. And at the same time, I'm still in the studio photographing, you know, glasses. Uh, um, what is this? A perfume bottle, right? <laughs> shoes um, and like at this point I was also really concerned at this moment of having two separate portfolios right I had to be like a, my commercial work and my commercial website I was even considering having like two different websites and uh, like for commissioned work and then my artist work and then at some point I really started to let those kind of things just completely I stopped caring about that and started to let the work all flow together, right? And like some stuff I shot maybe for a commercial work uh, would end up somehow used in a print that I was rephotographing or different ways. And I would start to use the same process I used on uh, a commercial job, right? Or something like that. Um, and that, and then working in that way, suddenly objects, were, I felt like objects were telling me how to photograph them. I, know, I don't know how to explain that better. I wrote that sentence here in my notes and I'm not sure what that means. But I believe that, like objects were telling me how to like deal with them. And I, that, that was like a really exciting moment, right? Like how can, I, how can I photograph this sausage to look beautiful or erotic or sensual? Or is it even possible, right? Is that ever a possibility? Or is it always like wet sausage and like a fishy fish, right? Is it, is it ever possible to like transcend those things? And I, I think it is sort of. Like I think this sausage is beautifully gross, but like beautiful. And that's also something, thinking about perception and taste and these different things. Taste, I mean, I guess I mean both kinds of taste, yeah. Um, and this is another image that kind of floated between, it was a commission, but also ended up in different things. It's called Tall Boy. And again, I'm, I think here I'm starting to really not only get interested in sort of um, these ideas of these sort of the way commercial imagery is made, but I'm also starting to really think about logos and branding and different things because that's all like a really important part of it. Um, and also just the illusion, like this is simply just like paper out of focus in the background and it forms that kind of thing. Or this is a paper out of focus in a Marlboro pack, it's called soft pack. Um, and then working with um, automobiles, right? And think this was these were a, a fun one called Chemical Car One and Two. And I was thinking of that same thing I was thinking about with the banana, um, how like uh, something can come from, like an object can leak into the back or the foreground. Um, these are ones that I never have. These two pictures are ones I've never fully understood where they reside between that sort of 
commercial practice and art practice because I've made them many years ago but I still really love these pictures but I still have no idea where they sit like I, I don't know if I could ever show them or put them in a book but I, I yeah they have some importance to me and they could be also because they were really fun to make and I think that's something that's really important in art making as well right is art is all these things but it's also meant to like bring joy right and bring like levity at times. It's supposed to point at all these things, but I think that's the thing that connects me to these pictures, is that, that they, I remember um, this moment of joy of like shooting this and being like, holy, wow, that looks totally different than I thought. My work is all failure based. I make a picture and when I make a picture I have an idea of what it's going to look like in my head and I feel like the art making process happens when I see that picture and it looks nothing like what I imagined. I always fail to make the picture I'm trying to make. And that's sort of where, I think that's where the beautiful moment happens for me. Uh, this is another BTS footage. Of, this was, I was in South Florida shooting a flamingo for a uh, hotel chain. And it was a really bad shoot. The, the flamingo made a lot of mess on the, <laughs> the ground. I didn't know flamingos do that. I know I didn't think of that. But in the end, the picture, after I, I didn't know how to deal with the picture and I ran it through like sort of my formula or my process, right? Where I photographed a print over and I cut paper and I laid it out. And again, this is a picture like the, that going back to the beginning where if you approach it, you can see cuts in the paper and you can see that it's not like a perfect picture even though it looks machine made in a way. And I'm really interested in that fine line. And I often get that line wrong. I often get that line where it looks too machine made, right? Like maybe a picture like this that doesn't quite have that same uh, reveal itself. This was a commission for Oakley, right? And in that commission I was shooting this model and then I started to do sort of body study of this model and then that picture sort of led into this picture that I worked that led me into this whole new body of work. Um, and this was the moment where my commissions were really bleeding into sort of my art making. Um, this picture was sort of the same technique as the flamingo. I was photographing a print through a screen using cut paper, using another print on it. And this led to another show I did called Particle Paradise. Um, I did this show also with Michael. Um, this is probably my first and last neon piece, but I made this for that show, um, which kind of felt like I was really thinking about signage and, and logos too, so I wanted to have like a sign for my show. Um, and this, this Particle Paradise body of work for the, furthered this idea of pictures floating up and out and into somewhere, like, like pictures that go to picture heaven, right? Like, like when you post a picture on some social media and it disappears immediately before you even get a chance to look at it. Has that ever happened to someone where you like post a picture and you want to see it and it's gone immediately? Like where do they go? And I started to think about that. And, in the process I was doing were, was allowing these pictures to feel like they floated up and out. Um, and in this process I also was thinking more and more about production and objectness and I wanted these pictures to feel like luxury objects. So I, some of them had like brass polished frames or chrome frames. And aside from asking where pictures go to live and die, I think this group of this body of work was really an exploration of luxury and how luxury applies to imagery and how luxury affects us, which is again sort of full circle back to I think where I began. Um, and if you can see here, there's all this, this was also, I started working with scotch tape. So all those lines, it's simply just tape um, put on a print and re-photographed. So again, it started to work with these banal material, but somehow sort of elevating it um, into this luxury feel or using sort of gels and lighting. And these are some install shots from that show, Particle Paradise. And again, another piece that I feel very confused about, it made it into the show and it was very much elevating a normal hop object like a cowboy hat or disco balls or those gold things are like stickers on paper that were photographed 
but this is also something I think about when I go to my studio, if I don't know what to do, I always refer to my list, right? I'm sure most of you screenshot, most of you keep lists. I screenshot, so like this was me going to the studio not knowing what to do. This is a picture from Irving Penn that I love because I think it's probably one of the worst pictures I've ever seen, but it's, it's like so bad, it's good. So when I go to my studio and I don't know what to do, rather than running out of ideas, I refer to my list. And this was one of my things on my list. So I tried to recreate that picture out of stuff I had in my studio. Um, so that's, this picture is, came out of this picture. So I think also that Warholian idea of co-opting and copying is something that's very important um, in making work and making art. In fact, my students have a copy assignment for this week, so. <laughs> um, and in that same show, you know, I even started photographing, just being in the studio and being like, oh, I even started to photograph the equipment I had in my studio, right? Like the lighting equipment, because that also felt like the back door of this luxury, right? The, the, ends, the ends of the luxury. And for better or worse, having this sort of formulaic way of making a picture has prevented me from ever not knowing how to make pictures or what to make pictures of, right? If I, don't, if I get stuck, if I didn't know what to do, I could just look at my list or lean into my sort of process. This is called Solo Cups. or gold helmet, and again, always exploring these sort of symbols of, not only of mm, objects that are meant like luxury objects, but also symbols of power and sort of these weird objects that were supposed to be masculine but could be very feminine at the same time, like thinking of these ways that objects could, again, become different and other. Um, this is called Red Adilette. Um, And here's other pictures from that show, all sort of made in that same way. And again, you can feel the objectness of them and that idea was going with the luxury. Uh, I wanted the pictures to feel like a luxury object. Um, and again, I still feel like there's this tightness to this work that I still am trying to shed, right? This is, they were made with extreme care and precision, precision and I feel like there's this tightness to them that even though they felt cloud cloudier, I was, I still in my work was trying to lose that tightness. Um, here's another one, this is called Smoker and it has, or no, it's called Cherry I think, and it has, it's again made with the scotch tape being rephotographed and I have a really nice behind the scenes BTS footage of this one being made. My poor friend who put up with that, but again, like I like to see like how these were made because it shows sort of the like the bad, the, the other side of it, like, ha, like this, this illusion that creates a picture that looks like this, that's actually made with, you know, a broken umbrella on a light um, and a smoke machine. So sort of the making of them becomes important. Um, and the same thing with, you know, shoes again. Uh, this is a multiple exposure with shoes and photographs of a flower. Um, and again, really thinking of this person elevating up and out of a way, like once they got their shoes, they transcended. <clears throat> and again, that's something from my commercial practice that made it into sort of the art practice. Yeah, this idea of transcendence. And he, here's some photos, it's hard to see in some of the JPEGs, but like, this is a production, this is from the, f the um, what's it called, the framer. And you can really see the objectness, you can see the physicality of the dye sublimation prints, you can see how shiny they are. It's a hyper gloss material. Um, there's no glass. Yeah, that was what I was yeah there's no glass, it's, it's a, and, it's, pr it's printed on this hyper gloss kind of finished aluminum where you can see your reflection in it. 
And it start, the reason I chose that because it felt the closest thing to looking at a picture as like when you look at it on here, right? Like it was the closest print I could find that felt like uh, an iPhone screen or a smartphone screen. It had this like hardiness and this hardness and it had this sort of reflective quality. Um, and of course it exaggerated that sort of blingy luxury feel idea I wanted in this, this body of work, right? Where they, they felt yeah, they felt substantial. Um, as I said, I also work in video. Um, I have a video piece that I've worked with. It's been taken a lot of forms over the years. I've shown it as a two-channel, one-channel, a four-channel piece. It's called the Violent Sequence. And it's, again, a still life piece, but it's in video. Um, I studied film. I went to film school, actually, before I studied. Somehow I ended up in still photography. Um, so. Um, moving image is still very much a part of what I do. Um, and it comes from a piece by uh, a 1970 Antonioni film called Zabrinsky Point. And I'll show a little clip from the film, but at the end of the film, Antonioni blows up a commercial real estate development, and it's sort of this anti-capitalist gesture. And it also features music by Pink Floyd. Um, and my piece, this is it as a two-channel, and it takes its name from Pink Floyd actually was hired by, or by uh, Antonioni to write a piece of music for that scene. And they wrote this very gentle piano song called The Violent Sequence. And Antonioni hated it. So he decided to use a more popular Pink, song, Pink Floyd song. So that song never made it into the film. Um, and I decided my take was to remake that piece, but rather than exploding um, the objects. What seemed much more terrifying to me is that we live in this sort of world where these objects are just constantly around us and available to us. Um, they're, out, they're always out there for you to take or to use and that, that just seems a lot more, the ever presence of objects around us seems a lot more terrifying than sort of the violence that Antonioni was using to fight back against that. Um, I was also really taken by that blue sky, right, that blue thing. And so this was shot in my studio with just a blue seamless. And um, a good friend of mine and I, we, sh we rented a, what's called a phantom camera. It's a really high frame rate video camera. And we were like throwing stuff and shooting it in high frame rate. And the idea is that the stuff circles around you and it's kind of ever present. And it's a silent piece because that song never played. That sort of, that song was never used and played. And it goes on and on for, it's, I think it's a 20 minute or so long piece. This is it as a ch two channel. This is, I showed this uh, as a four channel piece and this was a really nice version. This was in Italy at a gallery show and I like it because I was able to make it one channel where it's on all four screens and then it shifts between two single channels and two channels. It was like really, a really fun sort of way to like reconfigure it. And I like that idea of like modularness to a piece. Um, because even in more recent shows, I've started to use piece from an older show or another show that sort of has taken on a new meaning. Um, and it was a lot of fun to make this one too, right? Throwing chicken around and <laughs> all kinds of weird thing. It was really sort of, that moment where making art felt joyful and right and um, I don't know, I love those moments because there's a lot of moments when making art doesn't feel like that. So to have those moments when it does is also like a wonderful kind of thing. Um, these are some install shots of it. So it was a very large installation. Um, and then sort of this brings me to a body of work I did right as the pandemic was happening that's called Dream Date. Um, and then this is one I really embrace sort of this idea of logo and text and how they interfere and impose themselves on the majority of imagery we see, right? 90% of the pictures I look at have some sort of logo on them, have some sort of text on them. And I started to think about that in terms of the image surface. Um, and because I'm printing on aluminum, I could also cut the aluminum and make uh, sort of um, marks in it. So I found near my studio there's a guy that has what's called a high pressure water cutter and it actually uses sand and diamonds to cut and it could cut the aluminum in these very elaborate 
ways. So I was using logos and text in different ways to impose themselves into the actual image surface. Um, so that Mickey Mouse hands are actually cut in the picture. And the shape you see behind it is a print, another aluminum print that's behind it. Um, and these pictures are all done, made using that same sort of studio formula I've sort of come up with and mess around with a lot. But this time, because I was layering them and working with the surface, here you can see pretty well, like they had this sort of more dimensional sculptural quality to them, um, which was a new, a new phase, a new step for me, right? And so my pictures were all made using like multiple layers and multiple screens and gels, and so I wanted the actual physical picture to start to have layers too, and cuts that reveal layers in them. And, uh, you know, thinking about logos, this is called McSpeak, right? It's done the same way, but this time I'm using text bu bubbles cut into the surface. Um, and the, the background images that are behind a lot of the images, the, the colors, well, the majority of them are pictures of the sky, right? The majority of them are sunset pictures just shot really defocused. So it's like this idea that behind this is the sky sort of that idea that I got from Antonioni, I think, that make it made its way into these pictures. <clears throat> and again, working with shoes. If I don't know what to do in the studio, I'll just take some pictures of shoes. It's sort of my go-to <laughs> way forward somehow. <clears throat> and then also in this show, I, I really started to think about the way pictures work together um, and the way that rhetorical quality they had started to feel. And the show title, Dream Date, it came out of someone asking me a silly question of like, well, who's your dream date? What's your dream date? And it all fit into this idea I had of like this better other version that's possible, right? This better other me, this better other partner. I could have this better other life I could have. And so the pictures really were about that push and pull, about that perfection, sort of, reaching for it, but not quite, not quite getting it. And yeah, you can see the layers again here. <clears throat> and although most of my work is with objects and things, Every once in a while, like on a commercial shoot, I'll have a model that I'm able to, <laughs> I usually don't have someone come otherwise, but on a commercial shoot, I'll be able to like sort of come up with an idea that I'm able to adapt into my art work. And like I, this was just a guy that was at the studio and I had a helmet around and we had a Smurf sticker and we put a Smurf sticker on him. And it just, I don't know, it just seemed like this really erotic moment. And that's sort of what that picture is about, right? <clears throat> called Helmet Smurf. Or this one is called Night Palms. And again, thinking about palm trees, but also thinking about these 4x4 four four logos that were stickers on, I think this was, I forget what the, the car was that had this kind of, uh, kind of Miami feeling logo on it. <clears throat> and again, those groupings, and now I started, this is the first time I ever started cutting text or working with text. So these texts, the text is actually cut into the work itself. Um, and again, thinking about album art, thinking about sort of this period of nostalgia for work, um, I started to work with an album cover that felt very important to me um, from this period when I was thinking about making this work. Does anyone know the album? It's New Order Substance. So there's the, I separated the album cover. I meant to take a picture of the album for here, but my internet was not working in my studio, so couldn't do it. But yeah, it was sort of like separating album art and imposing album art into pictures. And this is an example of what those background layers look like. This is a picture of the sky here in New York, just out of focus, or you can see some slight clouds in the bottom. <clears throat> Um, and I think something I also came to during this show about putting shows together was trying to figure out a way to like unify the work as well because my pictures so often feel like just, just the nature of the way I work, they feel like the, they're like 
all over the place. So like by I, here I made everything the same size, I used all the same framing technique, I hung all the same way, so I felt like it started to read more mm, like sentence-like, even though that, that's not the right word for it, but they, it felt more readable, it felt more unified in a way, and I think it was like this kind of light bulb moment where something as simple as like size and scale and framing was able to do that. <clears throat> And that's a sky, that's just a sunset picture or sun, sunrise. I think this is where I was going to put the new order substance picture, but I forgot. And then here's one of cutting, literally cutting a sun into the sunset. I mean into the sky picture, cutting the circle into it. This is called Broken Blinds. Um, and that's also a studio picture. Again, that idea of Antonioni creating this fake blue has always been a thing I've thought about. <coughs> um, and so in these pictures, I think I push that idea of this kind of fabricated hyper-reality, but it feels a little more loose. It felt a little more loose uh, to me in this body of work. This is called Newports, and the one next to it is Green Apple. Right, and you can see sort of the layers and the cuts. Um, and not all of them were cut, right? Some of the work didn't need it, some it did. I don't know. I didn't, I'm not quite sure how I arrived to some of the cuts. Some of the images had them, some of them exist, like the shoe here. This is called uh, Holy Runner. And this is sort of like, a. this feels maybe like it's in the other body of work where these objects are floating up, but it felt, it felt like it worked in this, this body of work. Or this one that's called Knee Highs. It's the same, same sort of feel. Or Wrestlers. Again, finding something I'm interested in, right? Like this wrestling unitard thing and finding someone to pose and shoot it only because it just felt like it needed to be photographed to me. Or the same with this red bathing suits um, that felt the same. Um, and in the show, I also had a video piece that was called Dream Date the Video. <laughs> um, and this is a piece that I'm, I'm still sort of, sort of dealing with. Um, it's becoming a book, actually. Um, and I'll show the piece. And uh, it's sort of a, it's a mix of my own writing and random quotes, quotes I found on Twitter and TV and from movies. And it's inspired by a film um, called San Soleil by Chris Marker, um, which is a really beautiful film. It's kind of takes it's this sort of travel movie where he's traveling through Asia and Africa and the United States. It's just sort of random footage, but it's put together with a, a voiceover of people writing letters back and forth to each other. Um, and the feeling I get after I watch this movie, I think it's from 1982 or 1984, is that we are already living in an unreal place, right? We're already living in a place where we're in the future. And I, I feel like my version of it, it's, all, like it's even a more unreal place we're already living in where like communication and intimacy are like completely mediated, right? And this video is sort of about that mediated intimacy. Where do we start? What do we start? Call me back. They finally caught up to us, you'll say. They finally caught up to us. They always do, is what I usually say back. Are we almost there? Who are they? You ask me who exactly are the they we always talk about. Who are they? Can we give them a name? I decide not to call you back. My thoughts divide as much as unite. 
My words are united by what they express. And isolated by what they omit. Do you remember when you asked me to picture myself on an empty beach? When you feel overwhelmed and misunderstood, picture yourself on an empty beach. I can picture myself, I'll say. I can picture myself. It's easy. But the beach is becoming harder and harder to imagine. I know it's been a long time since I responded to your last message. It's been a long time since you responded to my last message. I write that I'm feeling overwhelmed and undercut. I'm stuck between an empty page and a vacation. You probably mean to say a blank page. That makes more sense. To say an empty page is confusing. Maybe an object is what serves as a link between subjects. Maybe objects allow us to live together. We would have been madly in love. But now I'm mostly just an angry lover. I upload a picture and it disappears immediately. You upload a picture and it continues on forever. Contrary to popular belief, chameleons don't change color to blend into their environments. Chameleons' color change happens in response to heightened emotion or new habitats. A shimmer happens in a beautiful but undisclosed location. He looks like he tastes like the smell of summer. Something catches our eye. Let's buy it. Let's add to our collection. Let's make it ours. Let's never let it disappear. It's always been all around us. It's just never been so easy to get financing. You recently tweeted Ride or Die. I was talking about you. I'd hoped you were talking about me. But I have a terrible credit score. If I want something, I don't think of consequences. And anyway, I don't really do fake. Is it real? It's real. The thought of going backwards makes me sad. And I'll always be too young. Don't you hear it? I can't hear it. I constantly end up guilty even though I feel innocent. Every event changes my daily life. I'm not going anywhere. I've already been everywhere. I do hear it. It's all champagne selling noise. I have to listen more than ever. I have to look around me at the world. At the world alone. The only place you find success before work is in the dictionary. It's alphabetical. Say my name. My name. Say it again. My name. Say what's my name. What's my name? What's your name? What's your name? Do you have a dream date? I've never been interested in authenticity. But it's sad to see a person change. I'd cry if it ever happened to me. I'm my own best friend. I wish I had a friend like me. 
I'm the reason I smile every day. My interest lies in a sort of leisurely curiosity. Someone real is sending real messages. Someone real is sending unreal messages. Someone unreal is sending real messages. Someone unreal is sending unreal messages. I always fail to communicate, to understand, to love and be loved. And every failure deepens my solitude. What's more recognizable, the tiger's color or its stripes? Tigers have striped skin, not just striped fur. The stripes are similar to fingerprints. I can't masturbate without looking at my phone. Maybe you forgot how to dream. I'm often bored. And I can't ever keep a secret. So that's sort of a collection of stuff shot from different maybe commercial shoots, stuff I shot on my own, some stock footage, some CGI stuff built with a friend and mixed with some of my own writings, but also a lot of stuff I found on Twitter from like Kim Kardashian or like mm -hmm. other people, right? Just collected into kind of this call and response folk, uh, conversation that is essentially my own voice pitched high and pitched low. Um, and that piece kind of uh, led into this other show called Soft Powers, which kind of piggybacked. This is like a modular show where I have some work from Dream Date but also some new pieces. I'm gonna kinda go through this quickly. Um, and it's sort of that same process, but this show, Soft Powers, I was really starting to think about this idea of soft power, and soft power is a way that, uh, you know, a, a country is taken over with Coca-Cola rather than missiles or bombs, or like culture and c capitalism take over via like softer methods, right? And I started to think about how pictures themselves are, have soft power to them. Um, I was thinking, of course, of the softness of a cat, right? But I was also thinking of the way that that softness entices us, makes us sort of give in to them, and that, the ideas of power. And here's another album cover from an album called Power, Corruption, and Lies that I cut into the, um, f into the aluminum as well. Um, or working with a picture. This was a, now I, I'm also starting to appropriate. This is a picture, I think, from a catalog of the 1984 Olympics. This is um, Carl Lewis, and this was a picture of him taken from some McDonald's campaign in the 1984 Olympics, where you could, I think you, if you got the right amount of tickets, you could win some sort of Olympic, uh, not Olympic, you could win like a Big Mac via the Olympics or something. So I started to think about all these things were connected and all these power and like the way power is put on to, to bodies and symbols and logos. Um, and again, also feeling the way that my pictures could be modular, right? There was some new work in this show, but there was some other work from other shows. Or cuts that appeared in another picture I then used in this show, like on a human body. I was really trying to figure out how the human body, which is sub subjected to all these things, all these forces, all these powers, um, I was starting to really think how that came to be. And thinking about tears and, I don't know, just the effects of these things. Because I feel like I often talk about sort of the beauty of this transformation, right? The beauty that, like, the potential that lies. But the reality is most pictures affect us that are at least, try they're trying to take something from us, right? Or turn us to do something. They're trying to get us to use our wallets. They're trying to get us to do things uh, we don't necessarily need to do, buy things we don't necessarily need, eat things we don't necessarily need. So there's the beauty trans of the transformative process, but there's also sort of the dark underground to it as well, right? 
Um, and this is a picture, I was thinking, I, I love tennis, but I would, artists also, are, also started thinking about Amazon, right? And so started thinking about the Amazon smile and like how that imposes itself on picture and sort of everything I see. And I probably spend the majority of my shopping on Amazon now too. It, I don't know, all these sort of, the dark underside I was starting to think about um, at this moment in this body of work. or even cutting emojis into pictures. And then lastly, I'm gonna end. I have a book project coming out next year um, with a self-published Be Happy. It's a London and Milan-based publisher, which is also gonna be a show, and the book is gonna be called Say Yes. And these are kind of like, pick, pick, the book is gonna be sort of a children's book of sorts. It's gonna be a board book um, on like heavy paper, like a pop-up book you might see, or books that kids can slobber on and that they don't break, like those heavy ones. But in the book there's going to be, where you see the dotted lines, there will be cutouts and it will re reveal the page behind it, kind of like the, kind of like the pictures I've been working on with the aluminum. And also text is really going to be an important part of the book. I'm starting to work with text and logo in a way where I'm making large screen prints of text that might be the same size as an image, right? This, you see the gray there, it actually reveals like the Coors Light can on the next page. Or logos cut like symbols, um, or this sort of shark love bite one. And here I have another fun BT, BTS behind the scenes of how that one was made, right? It's simply an album hanging. Um, and in this book, I'm going to work with logos. Like this is another, maybe for the exhibition, I'm thinking these, I'm not quite sure how these pieces are going to take form, but I'm going to have large text pieces or logo pieces that accompany sort of the work. It's still sort of stuff in process, but they would be two-part images um, framed and hung next to each other, right, with recognizable logos. Um, and we know what they represent, and, but how they also pull on us. And so like, yeah, I'm thinking the text pieces will be like these large, just simply screen cut pieces with some sort of other, it's still in progress, this work. Here's another fun BTS. <laughs> so I like to watch, I like going through my phone and finding all the junky sort of ways I shot stuff that look much more hyper real than they really were. And these are from spreads from the book. And then the way that logos also look like body parts or other things, thinking about these sort of fine line between that. Anyone recognize this circle logo? Target, Target yeah. <laughs> I like to think that, yeah. Um, yeah, so that's about, uh, that's it. That's where I'm going to end. Um, I'd love to, if anyone has any questions or comments, be happy to answer. But thank you for your time and listening. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So it's a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I know I'm shouting. I was intrigued by you said that your work is like motivated and formed by failure. <laughs> and so when do you like, how much do you fail or when do you say this is the direction? Like when do you know that the work is showing you versus what your mind wants to do? That's a hard question. I think about that a lot. Uh, you know, I think I, in a weird, like simple, answer is like I trust like I just know like I intuitively know and I I know most of you that make work have that same feeling when you know there's just at some point when I know but then there's a lot of times I don't know and I have to ask somebody and <laughs> and they're usually like I don't know either but <laughs> um, but I think also the failure is is the exciting part because um, I learn every time I make some bad choice or you know, a piece of film or exposure doesn't come out right. Well, I think there's always something that I'm able to like take from that or maybe I rescue it in the next piece. Um, and I had the luxury of studying under Nayland Blake, who is a great sculptor and artist. And um, he had this thing that has always stuck with me. And he, he said, you know, when you make work, don't try to fix it. Don't go back and try to fix your work. Fix it in the next piece. And like that's, I think that's really simple, wise way. Like, 
um, to leave it go and get it next time, right? Because um, I've often spent a lot of time trying to rescue something that maybe is unrescuable. Yeah, thank you, Joseph. What uh, I was interested in was this idea of music in the mm -hmm. like, you're a musician, and obviously you've shown these different places, albums and other mm -hmm. things, and when, where even the pieces in the gallery can start to have a musical relationship. Mm -hmm. Is there more to, to how music and music in your life is influencing your photography and your practice? Yeah, uh, I mean, music was the first thing I did creatively. Um, and so it's also the thing that moves me the most. Um, I don't know if it's happened to anyone. I'm sure it has where you're driving in a car and a song comes on and you start weeping for some random reason, right? It's probably happened to everyone. I don't go and see a photograph and start weeping. I don't go and see a painting and start weeping. Maybe I weep in a movie, but it's usually because they're doing it to me. But like songs have this ability to like move me in a way that no other art does. And I think about that a lot. I listen to music when I'm working. Um, and that's sort of where this book in the end is going. I'm, I think like I, I was thinking about pictures with words in the same way that songs have words. Um, I'm not sure where this new work is going. I know where the book is going, but I, I don't know where the show is going. But I know that lyrics have to some, that like I would call those pictures lyrics or making pictures of lyrics. So yeah, that's, that's yeah, a very important piece yeah, to, the, to the work. I'm sorry, this, um, I, have, I have actually two questions. Sure. The first one's really easy. Are you, are you still shooting on film? Sometimes, I do a mix mostly. Um, and um, how much of this overlapping and layering actually happens in Photoshop and how much of it actually happens in the camera? Because you've mentioned a couple of times it was yeah, in the camera. Yeah, it depends on the piece. A lot of times um, it'll happen in camera when I'm, when I'm working with film and then it'll get to a certain point. I use a medium format digital um, Hasselblad and I also use a contacts medium format and in the end I'll, I may mix them both. Um, yeah. Okay, thanks. Because um, it's hard to sort of get a sense of it when I'm looking at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. That's just a technical question. The other question's a little harder. It comes back to that sort of feeling when you're seeing a photograph. And mm. um, I think the work's actually incredibly brilliant. It pulls in all kinds of things. Thank it you. looks really interesting. Um, but what I have to say is that the emotion I get out of it is like it makes me depressed. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, that's I mean, not necessarily a bad thing, mm. but um, the phrase that runs through my mind is um, ab advertising is just war by other means. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking about with soft power, right? Yeah. It's like and conquered by other that ways. That to me is incredibly depressing. Um, and I, you know, in, in much the same way that Warhol is depressing to me, I have a little mm. phrase, it's all Andy's fault. <laughs> um. Well, you know, there's an interesting case right now going to the Supreme Court about the, the rights of the Andy Warhol pictures, which I'm <laughs> fundamentally against them protecting the photographer. Yeah. I believe Andy Warhol has the right. I know that's a weird spot to land, but... It's a really interesting conversation mm. to carry on. Yeah. Um, uh, but you are getting a pretty strong emotional reaction from mm. me about this, yeah. and it has to do with sort of feeling kind of lost in this um, sort of empty space of advertising. So yeah. I don't know if you I, have a I, comment I, about that. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's, I think there's, I think it can be both depressing and not depressing, right? Like, um, you know, like, what's the word for a word that means two things at the same time? Um, I always use the example of a jumbo shrimp, right? Like a shrimp is, can't be jumbo because it's shrimp, right? But <laughs> oxymoron, thank you, good. Right, so the work can do that too because, sure, this idea that it's depressing is ever present, right? But this weird idea that's deep in there is like there's a better version out there too. There's something transformative about that. I, we can't get it. We, We're, they're we, never going to let us get it. We can right? have coffee someday. <laughs> yeah. Talk about that. Yeah. I don't want to like. Hog yeah, it's mic. something I think about all the time. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, we're, the work. I want it to, to be pressing. I want it to be maybe. I hope it's funny sometimes. It is funny. And I hope that it also is beautiful. It sometimes. is beautiful. I hope it's all those things. Yeah. 
the kind of music I like is all those things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do I have to stand? Can I <laughs> you can sit. <laughs> oh, this is probably recording. Yeah, the film, I watched it a couple of times. Before I picked your class, during your class, and this is probably the fifth time that I watched oh, it. Wow. Every time, every time it gives me a depression because like well, he just mentioned, it's like a dream date, but it's making me very depressed. Not only the narration, but the imagery itself is like so, it's like um, your whole presentation, like oxymoron. <laughs> and the film is like dream date, dreaming images, but it's not ending up well. So <laughs> it's like dreamy, but sad. Anyways, that's not my question. Um, <laughs> my question is, I noticed that your previous work is so s different mm. than like your current work. Mm -hmm. Before it was like so sharp and um, very vivid. Now mm. it's like more dreamy and blurry. How do you feel about that? Because you know, as young artists, we m I'm developing something yeah. new other than like two years ago. And how do I accept? my older work as a part of my work and maybe something new will come in future years and how do I rep like present myself as the same artist? Yeah, I, in relation to my own work, when I look at it all, I f to me I see like a very visual, clear timeline and evolution. Um, but I've of often, and I've talked to you about it before, where I have had moments where I put up all my work and it feels like it's 10 different photographers doing it or 10 different artists. And my advice to anyone who has that feeling is, who cares? Like, you can find a way, because pictures are rhetorical, right? Because pictures have power. Like, if you can't figure out how it all fits together, start making weird pairings and finding the way things fit together that way. Because I, I do think this idea that my work needs to look like this, my work needs to look like this, but wait, what if I want to do this? How does this fit with that? It, it really doesn't matter. You're making your work for you in the end. And so your journey, as cliche as that sounds, is your journey. And so finding that is sort of the exciting part, right? Is how does it fit together? Because the work is all a product of things you've seen and made and looked at. So it's all, it's all there. There is always a thread. Um, I was actually really happy when I looked at my presentation this morning because I was like, wow, I feel this like I didn't ever have this sort of, I never put all of the stuff together before. And when I looked at it this morning, I was like, um, I was like, oh, I do, it does feel the same. Even though it looks different here and there, like the thing, the, the impetus always came from the play. So I, I, yeah, my, I always tell students and other artists, like, let that go. That's been put, pounded into you by art professors and portfolio reviews, and I, I think that yeah, I would go contrary to that and say it doesn't matter. There's always a way to fit it. You gotta, maybe you, like you have to say, oh, that picture is not good or it doesn't fit here, but there's always a way. Um, last thing I'll say is I hate the word portfolio, right? Like, Thank you. <laughs> I think that's something that needs to also be like, that, how do we update that? I think there's just like bodies of work we make, right? The portfolio assumes that we have to fit into a certain box because a portfolio literally goes in a box or a book or whatever. And so I feel like that like automatically is putting a constraint and a limit. And by letting that idea of portfolio go and thinking this is my, this is a body. I mean, I'd rather be in a body than a box, right? Like, so I would think that's what I would want my work to be too. Anyone else? Okay, good. Thank you so much for coming. Joseph Jessler Costa, thank you so thank much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks.